Welcome to Profit Led, a podcast by and for bootstrapped founders brave or crazy enough to grow a business to profitability with very few resources. Profit Led is brought to you by eWebinar, the leading automated webinar platform built to save you from doing the same webinar over and over again, from sales demos to customer onboarding to training. This season, Profit Led's host, Melissa Kwan, who is also co founder and CEO of eWebinar, will walk you step by step through the company's journey to a million. Melissa is a three time bootstrapper who has spent 13 years building startups. Together with co host and eWebinar COO, Todd Parmley, they will dive into one major topic per episode, sharing war stories, mistakes, and lessons learned as they grew the company to a million in annual recurring revenue 36 months after product launch. So buckle up, fellow bootstrappers. It's going to be one heck of a ride. Welcome to today's episode of Profit Led. I'm Melissa Kwan, co-founder and CEO of eWebinar and your host. I'm here with my co-host, Todd Parmley, eWebinar's COO. Hey, Todd, how's it going? It's good. I've recovered from COVID. I feel very like retro. (laughs) Yeah, I thought it disappeared forever. (laughs) I know. And so that's why I have this kind of like bedroom voice. So So I've been on over 100 podcasts in the last year, but you're pretty new to this since we started Profit Led. We are 10 episodes in with you as my co-host. Any feedback so far on what it's like to make this podcast? No, I mean, the truth is, is I was very nervous at the beginning. I got my MFA in acting. And when I finished school, I gave it up because I couldn't stand in front of an audience anymore. Like I had terrible (laughs) stage fright. And so this was like in its own weird way, like my reintroduction to an audience. So I was nervous at first and now it just feels like we're chatting. Yeah. I mean, the last time we made this, we had two episodes where we were together in person in Bangkok. So that was that kind of a cool happens. experiment. Yeah. I wish we could do more of those, actually. Maybe one day I'll come to come to New York. Every time I want to go to New York, I'm like looking at accommodations. I'm like, I can't go to New York. It's just a whole different world right now. <laughs> so in the last episode, we talked about the importance of founder-led sales and how that was essential for us getting feedback on our products so we could find more paying customers and how... Any founder can learn how to sell by following a very simple, tried and tested demo script that I had created. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about how we leverage our best customers to sell our product by using language that they use to describe our value propositions and basically how we solve their problems for them. So uh, why don't we start off by you explaining what that means to you? What does it mean to leverage your best customers to sell your product? Like, How would you describe that? Yeah. I mean, I think when people hear that, they immediately say, oh, get customer testimonials, get referrals. And while I think that's important, there's a much bigger piece to leveraging your best customers to sell your product. So what I mean by that is in the beginning, version zero of the product, we made up everything that went onto our website, right? Like this is like pre-launch and we talked a bit about that in the beginning episodes. So value props, case studies, landing page. When you have customers, you have real use cases from real people. And before that, we were just guessing based on what we thought we knew, which is a very, very limited point of view. So for example, I hugely overestimated the needs of our prospect. When we launched the product, we realized most people didn't get our solution right away. So after we launched our product, we realized we needed to over explain instead of in the beginning when we're writing our landing page, we're like, well, everyone's going to understand this. So let's just put something out there. Once you have your best customers, then you can figure out, okay, what am I actually solving for them? How are they describing eWebinar in their mind? And then how do we extract that information and put that on our marketing material? Yeah. I mean, it was even as simple as in our first version of the website, our CTA was sign up, right? It was sign up everywhere, sign up now, sign up for a free trial. But people weren't getting it. So our CTA changed to sign up for our demo. Because since we use eWebinar to demo our product, it's like you're actually experiencing the product firsthand. And then that led to a higher conversion rate because people were like, oh, now that they've experienced it, they made the mental leap and could understand. Yeah. I mean, we actually had some join a demo, some sign up for a very long time, well into a year and a half. And then we realized like every sale requires either a conversation or a demo plus a conversation within the demo. So then we realized, 
why do like no one is going to sign up without watching the demo and then asking us some clarifying questions. So why don't we just remove sign up? So the only sign up button we have is the actual sign up button at the top of the landing page or at the top of the website. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm still a little baffled by that. <laughs> yeah. Why doesn't everyone just want to sign up right away? What's wrong well, with that? Well, why don't they get it? I mean, I just I have to remember I went through the same process actually. So it's it's uh but it's easy to forget because it's once you get it, you're like, "Whoa, I'm never going back." Well, today I had a person in the demo, which is for context delivered through eWebinar on demand, and the question was can I use this product to replace my demo on my website? You came here from our website through the demo button. And yet you still have to ask that question. Well, and the first two minutes of the script are like, this is eWebinar. Everything you are looking at right now is eWebinar. So that's a, that's a problem we live with. I think we've solved it pretty well, actually, to be honest. But I mean, in the beginning, it was it was definitely much more hectic. But the thing is, people don't listen and they don't read. Another thing kind of unrelated to what we're talking about is within the first three minutes, they're like, what is the price? So then while we don't say this is the price, we pop it up in our interaction that says, if you want to know the pricing, click on this. And they were still asking that question. So then we overlaid see our pricing button on top of the demo video. And while that had helped, people still ask that question. Sometimes people still ask that question after they click on the button. I mean, sometimes I wonder if they're testing chat with that question, but like, yeah, that would be better. I, that's what I tell myself to live with myself. Back to the the uh, topic at hand. We're talking about leveraging our customers to sell our product. So what did you do? Like, what was the process? Just to kind of backtrack a bit on why... I even wanted to engage in this this process in the in the first place. Um, I didn't know that I had to go through this process. So I had two startups before this. Both were sales led. So like sales led meaning I would go out to sell one on one, go to conferences, um, you know, have partnerships, you know, nurture customers in those conferences, and that was the only way I knew how to find revenue. So coming to eWebinar, I didn't realize that. It was a marketing-led product, a customer-led or a growth product, I guess. I had no concept of what it meant to need to market something, right? Getting people to sign up without me talking to them. I was running out of leads. I was actually doing a lot of direct outreach for the first like six to nine months. And I was joining all these like growth hack groups or SaaS marketing groups. Mm. A lot of them were on Facebook. Some of them were on Slack. And I came across this group called SaaS Growth Hacks. And the founder of that group, I think he's since exited that, was this guy named Aaron Crawl. And I reached out to him because uh, I think he was offering some like consulting packages on, you know, how he can help us kind of get to the next phase of our business, which is... Like, how do I get people to sign up or even come to us without talking to them? So that was the biggest challenge that I had at the time. And he had helped startups in our stage before kind of get to that next get to that next step. And he was like, well, in order for me to help you get further, you need to rewrite all your content. And this is the process we need to go through, which is extracting all the marketing language from your customers because I'm reading your website. And it doesn't really communicate clearly what you guys are doing. So unless it does that, I'm not going to be able to help you. I actually engaged him for this specific project. This, I guess it would be called product marketing. And the process is really choose your 10 best customers and go through an, a deep dive with them and figure out, you know, how you're actually helping them. What, what was their life before and, and after? What are some quantifiable results? And then creating this huge matrix of language you can use then in not just your marketing website, but also any communication that you use with your customers. So whether it be the emails that they get after they sign up for a trial or onboarding or churn or ad copy, you know, anytime you talk to a customer, you need to kind of refer to this language. So that was the process that we were going to go through. And kind of one of the points is that you are literally using their words, right? You don't like listen to them and then try to put it in your own words. As much as possible, you're trying to use the exact terms that they use. Is that right? Yeah. So I guess the goal was to create this, this huge kind of content matrix, but it was also to extract keywords that they use and look for patterns and then be able to, I guess, regurgitate it back to them, right? In sales, there's actually a very similar process, which is you run a discovery call with a customer 
And then when you try to close the deal, you use their language to close that deal. I mean, for lack of a better term, I guess in sales, you can make someone feel in theory stupid if you use their words and then they don't close on that deal. (laughs) So if they're like, well, I want to increase operational efficiency. And then you're like, well, my product helps increase operational efficiency, you know, by X. So they would have to agree with you. So this is like a similar process. I hear what you're saying. I think it's actually, at least for myself on the internet, is when I go somewhere and someone speaks directly to my problem in a way that's specific, I do perk up because I'm like, they understand what I'm talking about. And I guess that's the whole point. I guess what's what's really interesting that I learned from this process or even learning about the process in, in itself is everything that you need in marketing, like all the content you need in marketing already exists within your customers. So a lot of times like we're kind of beating our heads against a wall trying to figure out what is the marketing language when everything you need already exists, right? And when you're just starting to build a company, you don't have a choice, right? You're just guessing, right? This is how people are going to react to my website, or this is how people are going to use it based on the problem you think you're solving. But the problem you think you're solving is not necessarily the problem you are solving, or you're not articulating it in exactly the right way as your customers are are thinking about that. I mean, can you talk more specifically about the process? Like, how did you identify your 10 best customers? You then, what, emailed them? What was the actual interview like? I would love to hear some of that. Yeah. So the process was extremely simple, but very time consuming. So picking your best customers is not necessarily the 10 customers that pay you the most. I mean, I think that's a good indication. You can always go to Stripe and, you know, fill real customers and who paid you the most and then just go down from there. Um, but it's also, especially as a new product, people that are getting in touch with you often to give you feedback. Sometimes they are your most annoying customers because they want this to work for them so badly. It could be people that don't think your product has all the features, but are still using it because they love it so much, right? It's the people that your product or service is solving the biggest problem for. And these are usually people, especially in the beginning, that you hear from the most, right? The people that you have the most impact from. So what I did was, of course, I filtered out the people that are paying us the most. But as a founder that was doing founder-led sales for so long, I also kind of have an idea of the people that we are helping the most. But I also made a conscious decision to choose people from different industries and also different roles. So whether it be sales or marketing or customer success, so that we had a mixed bag. Because at that point, we didn't know who our ideal customer was. We're talking like six to nine months post-launch. So it was like anything goes. So we were also going to, after this exercise, figure out who are our ideal customer profiles and how do we find more of those people. So this process is time consuming first because nobody wants to get on a call with you. So you have to reach out sometimes multiple times, ask them to set up, set aside an hour, an hour and a half just for you to ask them, you know, all these questions. Sometimes they reschedule and then you don't get the content that you want. So that process, I think, I think for most people, I think Aaron expected it to take like six months because I was in such a hurry to, to get to, you know, revenue or profit positive. Um, I think it probably took me like two or three months. Um, so oh, yeah, the output of that, <laughs> I mean, I'm always relentless, right? <laughs> I'm like always looking at a <laughs> countdown clock. But the output was this giant document that was searchable, that had industries, that had roles. We had tagged them with, uh, you know, was it customer success? Was it marketing? Was it time saving? You know, so it, it just became a really useful document, kind of like a marketing Bible that we could use. And then from there, the next step of that process, after we extracted the information, was really working with Aaron as well on figuring out, okay, now that we have all this content, how do we turn it into case studies, landing pages, home pages, activation emails, churn emails, right? How do we use this to send out 10 emails within 14 days to convert them into a paying customer? I think it's self-evident in a way, but why do you think this process this exercise was so valuable to us. If you had to like really boil it down, what was the most valuable part of it? I mean, I didn't know this before because I was so sure of the problem that we were solving for our prospects and customers because I was so close to that problem that it didn't even occur to me that people 
would come to the website or learn about our product and think it's not going to help them. Like, I know that sounds super naive, right? To, to people that are listening, but like, I guess sometimes as a founder, you need to have this level of confidence and delusion and naivety to be like, yeah, of course I'm going to build this product because everyone's going to buy it. And that was actually how I thought about it. So when we launched the product and people weren't swarming to our website and referring their friends and writing Captera reviews, I was like, well, what's going on here? So um, going through this exercise allowed me to feel like, okay, we're not shooting in the dark. This is what people found valuable. This is where we're falling short. Because I also talked to some people that eventually churned. So also understanding where we weren't helping them, but also understanding that, yes, even if we're solving the same problem for this set of people, the pain that they were feeling were on different levels. So really like that was also kind of a surprise, right? So I don't mean when I say when you stop shooting in the dark, it's like, I don't just mean understanding the problem that we're solving, but also bringing myself back to reality to oh, okay, we're actually solving this problem for people, but they're all on different spectrums. And that's why people aren't signing up in droves. Like not everyone that feels the problem that you're solving feels it as intensely as you thought they would or as I did, you know, in the past, which is how I came up with this product to begin with. But it's also encouraging to know, hearing from your best customers, that you're on the right path, right? We have people that signed up on day one that are still with us. And they've grown with us and we've taken a lot of their feedback and put it into features. I also think the the other valuable thing is this is a relationship building exercise, right? In the beginning, you need as many cheerleaders as you can get. So these are people that are going to tell their friends that are going to let you film them for a case study. We still have case studies and customer stories on our website from this process because at the end, um, because I'm the salesperson that I am, I always ask them, oh, do you mind if I cut this interview up into a customer story that we can show off on our website? 80% of them will say yes. The other 20% is usually a publicly traded company and we can't use that footage. But I basically took a one hour interview. I chopped it up into, you know six to eight short form videos, and then wrote a customer story coupled with videos that that still lives on our site. So now that's become a different piece of asset. And then now you have this relationship with them. You can always reach out to them and ask them, hey, we're doing this. What do you think of this? Or can you write a review on this? Can you introduce me to other people in your industry? right? Can we use your logo on our website? So it was valuable for, I guess, not just bringing us into reality, but also encouraging us to go further and also kind of solidifying those relationships with our raving fans, especially within the first year. Yeah. And like you said, like it sometimes is hard to get them to open the door, right? To meet for that first call. But I do think that once you've had that first interaction with them and they realize kind of the depth of the interaction too, that they like it. They enjoy being a resource. They enjoy being having their opinion heard. So, you know, that channel does stay open for a long time. Right. Like they can't wait to share their feedback with you because then you might take that to create features that actually help their job. I just want to go back to something you said. You talked about it. You were like, I think I was a little naive. I didn't just immediately understand the problem. I mean, that is, first of all, it's human nature, but that when I was worked as a product manager, like I had a sign at my desk with a finger pointing at me that said, you are not the customer because you really think you are. You just think you're, you, you're in it, you're working on ideas and then you talk to them and yeah, you might be 80% right. You might be 90% right, but that extra 10 to 20% is actually the difference between a, a good product and a phenomenal product that people will like share with their friends. I mean, I think some of those surprises too that like came out from these conversations was that there were problems we didn't know about that we were solving, right? We thought that we wanted to help them automate these webinars so they can save time. That was it, right? You never have to do them live because doing them live is exhausting. And then you realize this person I'm talking to actually don't mind doing it live, but they have these other things that we're helping them solve. Like they maybe they wanted 10 other pieces of content, but they can't do all of it. So we aren't really solving the live versus automated problem for them. We're solving the content problem for them. I mean, another surprise that 
I came across was how many different personas and roles were actually using the product, right? So we designed it really for trainers because I wanted to use something like eWebinar to train in my previous startup. So I designed eWebinar for trainers to replace all their training and onboarding. But having these conversations allowed me to understand that there were many different personas that were using the product. In fact, it was so diluted, I think, in the beginning that we couldn't really pick our ideal customer profile. And I know a lot of people say, oh, you should stick with one ICP. You should focus. You should niche down. And while I think that could be good advice for a company in a later stage, as a bootstrap company, we couldn't afford to only focus on one ICP, right? Because we did have trainers. A lot of them were my friends from other real estate startups because my last company was in real estate, but there was also sales, there was marketing, there were course creators using this to sell, but also to deliver their evergreen courses. There wasn't one clear winner, like an ideal customer profile. And because we were so early, there were so few companies that had moved up to level two or level three. A lot of people were using our lower plans. And so I kept getting this advice from other founder friends of mine, other mentors saying, oh, you need to pick one ICP. Otherwise, you're not going to increase your revenue. And I know that that's a very popular piece of advice, but that wasn't a piece of advice that I personally subscribe to because at that point we were making 10,000, 15,000, but we were burning something like 40,000. And this was like our own money because we invested our own money into this. So I don't care who was coming through the door. If they were going to pay us, they were our ICP. Well, I think spending longer with multiple ICP and not knowing for sure, give us time to figure out what the pros and cons of each were and where later on we would want to maybe focus more. But at the time, it was just about let's get the existing revenue that's showing up through the door. Let's just get them through the door and let's learn. Um, Yeah. And I mean, I don't think we even got to revisit that, you know, in the way that we wanted until like past a million, right? And this podcast is about like getting to a million. So I know that maybe in other types of companies, this advice applies better. But for us, we just wanted money in, right? Every day I was like refreshing Stripe and wanting money in. So I think my advice on that is like, sometimes people ask me like, what what is some like counterintuitive advice that you've received or like normal advice that you don't subscribe to? And I, I would say like, this is one of them is like, when people say you have to choose one niche, one persona, one industry, one role to sell to, especially in the beginning, I don't subscribe to it. And I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I took a course from Leah Theron recently, a product led growth course. And one of the things she said is like, if you have a good idea, you can muscle it to a million. And then when you're getting into more of a growth phase, then you do need to become more focused. I mean, I I think that there's real value in the process of just pushing forward and getting revenue. Hey, I'd like to take a second here to talk about my own company, eWebinar, and our mission to rescue people from what I call webinar hell to give them back their time and save them literally hundreds of hours every month through webinar automation. If your sales team is tired of doing the same demo over and over for unqualified leads or worse, prospects who don't even show up, An on-demand demo powered by eWebinar can help them get their time back so they can close more deals. If you're doing customer onboarding and training on repeat, eWebinar can help you automate those so you never have to do them live again. Customer success teams are using eWebinar to run hundreds of sessions every single month without a live host. Why don't you give our product a try and see for yourself? Visit eWebinar.com to join our own on-demand demo or to sign up for a free trial. All right, now that I've gotten that on my system, Let's get back to the episode. And also don't forget, like if you're, and we're talking about the early stages, right? Like within the first year or, and, and even like, I mean, it took us three years to get to a million, but so we're really talking about the first three years. Like you don't really have the luxury to pick and choose because you're also trying to make a better product. Like all our resources were actually going towards making sure that the product was stable and making sure that we had the basic features that people expected. And I wasn't like right now, I only focus on marketing and content and demand gen. But back then I was doing everything. So I didn't have time to only focus on this one thing if I'm also doing all the QA, the product, the customer support and marketing and sales. Well, something that you just reminded me of that I wanted to uh, share with you is that after you did this exercise was the time where I was trying to figure out content marketing for the first time ever, right? Trying to figure out how to get people to discover us on the internet through organic search, come to a article, a blog post, and then convert. And so 
what I did, having not gone through the process that you went to, I was very much aware of the matrix that you'd created and I used it myself. And maybe it's just the way that I am, but I needed to sort of kind of have a mini version of that experience that you had. So I listened to all of the interviews. I went through all of the transcripts. I copied and pasted them into themes. And I created my own kind of like Bible for persuasive business writing as to why eWebinar is the best in the market. That document which was basically a, it was sort of like a before and after of each of our main use cases. What was their life like before? What was their life like after? Um, That became the primary source of of research material that I used to write all of our articles that then ended up having a decent conversion rate because they were speaking in the specific language of the customer we were trying to reach. Yeah. And just to kind of go back a bit on that process, like extracting all this information is really step one. Like it creates a foundation for a lot of different content pieces that sit on top. Like your role was to create kind of like SEO optimized pieces of content where people could find us on the internet. My role was to figure out how to use this to create pieces of content to get people into a trial and then convert after the trial. And if they don't convert, using that language to remind them over the next year that we exist and maybe they should come back and sign up. Some of the ways that we use that content, because we were asking like, what was your life before and after? What are some of the value propositions? What are your favorite features? What's the ROI? What do you not like the most? What are your top three objections? Like things like that. So all of the activation emails after they sign up for a trial right? All of the onboarding emails, if they convert, and then all the churn emails, if they cancel or do not convert is based on that, right? It's case studies based on that. It's using all the language to say, oh, did you know we have these five top features? Those five top features were basically extracted from that document. Or like, um, you know, if we were to address an objection, right? Like, so a, a very, very common objection would be like, well, isn't live better than automation. So we made that a subject line and we had that very early on in the activation emails. And also we included some of this language in our demo follow-ups. So isn't live better than automated? So where we took all the objections that this group of customers gave us before they really saw first value and we created a bunch of emails and and content to help handle those objections such that they would sign up after the demo. Yeah, I mean... We're not exaggerating when we say this became like the source of all of our content. I mean, the heart of it, right? The heart of it. So there's no question. So let's talk now about how people can do this for themselves. Like, when do you think people should start doing this? Like, when's the right time to do this exercise? I think as soon as you have a small group of raving fans, you can probably already start doing this. The more, of course, the more data you have, the more effective this exercise can be. But if you have, five or 10 raving fans, people that absolutely love your product and are paying for it. I don't mean people that are using it for free. Like if they use it for free, they're in theory, not taking it very seriously, right? Like they, they do not see enough value in your product to pay for it. So they're not going to give you feedback, right? The moment you ask someone to even pay $10 for it, they'll tell you everything that's wrong with your product. So you want to get as real feedback as possible. And you can only get that from your paying customers. And so I think this this exercise is actually quite daunting for people that maybe aren't in sales. I've I've spent, uh, you know, over a decade in sales. I'm very comfortable talking to customers and and reaching out. If you don't think you're going to be good at running this process, definitely find someone to to help you, whether it's a consultant or someone else on your team. Um, But what you need to do is identify your best customers based on how actively they engage with you and perhaps, you know, how big their company is. In theory, your ICP. So if you are, if your product is best for small, medium sized companies, maybe try to go after those, you know, as a, as a source of, of data, you know, just set up a one hour call with them and let them know that you're doing customer deep dives to help better understand how they're using the product. So I actually put together a list of 48 customer deep dive questions that I'll share in the show notes. So if you go to profitlet.fm, find episode 11 in season two, you'll see this document at the top. These are the exact same 48 questions that I use to run this process. And in that hour that you have with them, make sure they know that you're recording it just for research purpose, but you would appreciate if you can use some of that footage in the customer story as well. But you can always ask that 
um, when you're actually in person because you'll you'll get a yes. You'll more likely get a yes if you ask that in person and just try to hammer out as many of those 48 questions as possible and just go down the list. And, and the best thing to do when, you, when you're doing these interview deep dives is to stay silent if they're just on a roll, if they're giving you a lot of information. And if you feel like this person is giving you more information than other people, because some, some people like to be more talkative, ask questions like, tell me more. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? So try to extract as much as possible and use up that hour. And I think you're going to find that some people aren't very good at giving you as much data as, as you want. Um, but, you know, you're likely not going to get them on the phone again. So like just squeeze as much as possible from that. I mean, one thing that I also do with my own customer interview process, which used to be much harder than it is now, now that there's like automatic transcription software, is that I used to listen to the interviews and basically write down little phrases. Now I just run the interview through a transcriptor and I copy and paste them into themes. It's like a sorting exercise with post-its if you've ever done that before. It's basically you're creating themes and you start to group them. And for me, that helps me make connections that I might not make otherwise because sometimes things come up at different points throughout the conversation. And that exercise for me has been tremendously helpful in sort of identifying the major themes that are coming up in the interview. Yeah. And I would say the interview again is step one. Most people can run the interview, but don't know what to do with the content afterwards. Like writing content, if you don't have a Todd on your team is extremely, extremely difficult. I did not write all the content myself. I wrote the actual words myself, but I didn't put it together myself. So when I said I worked with Aaron Crawl, I don't know if he's taking projects anymore in, in this way. He might be. But he walked me through the process of how to take all this information and make an activation email. What is an activation email? What is a churn email? And there are, you know, product-led courses that you can take now. And there are also consultants, like content consultants especially, or product-led consultants that can help you take this content and make it into something. So it's very likely that you'll be staring at all these documents afterwards and be like, okay, what do I do with this now? There are also companies that will run the interview process for you, but they are very expensive. I think like most startups probably can't afford that part of it, but you can always work it out with a consultant and have them do putting together a piece of it. So I know like Forget the Funnel, for example, they will do the interview work for you and also execute on writing the content if you need, but they don't have to do the interviews for you. Um, especially in the beginning, it's like founder-led sales, right? Like I would really highly recommend founders to run this process themselves. Like it's your customer, you need to hear about it firsthand. And then a lot of that feedback, you can put towards making a roadmap. The thing that really works for me is the before and after thing. Because if I can understand what the person is, what they were experiencing, the problem they were experiencing before and how their life changed and got better because of our product, then when I write content, I assume that the person is in the before state and I'm trying to draw them over into the after state. And so I'm thinking about what can I talk to them about in the before state that will make them realize that I know what I'm talking about and that I understand their problem. And then that naturally leads into explaining how we take them to the other side of that. So that that journey in writing content from before to after is kind of how now I think about everything. I mean, it's similar to the framework that you use, which is like the enemy and then the hero shows up, right? It's the it's a very similar approach, but that that helps me a lot. Also, when people talk about before and after, they also bring up the objections. So a lot of people are like, well, before I signed up, I thought maybe we would lose touch with our customers. I thought that our customers would think we're faking it and not like an automated webinar versus a live one. But I decided to try it anyway. And the feedback was actually really positive because people could watch it on demand. So then all of that language, we don't just use in creating pieces of content. We use it in responding to people in our demos, right? Because people in our demos have objections. People on LinkedIn have objections, right? There's multiple times when people are talking about eWebinar on LinkedIn and somebody inevitably will be like, oh, I hate this type of webinar because it doesn't convert, because it's fake, because it's this. So then I will be able to use what our customers said about that. And then be able to respond intelligently, publicly on platforms like LinkedIn. I mean, this is effectively what you're saying. But the way I think of it is what assumptions do they hold, right? They, they don't even realize they have the assumption that live is better than automated. They just, that, they just know that. When you write, 
assuming that that person already has these assumptions that they may not even realize they have is a good place to start because that's what you're dealing with. How can you get someone from point A to point B? So by the end of the piece of content that they've that you've written, they've gone on a little mini journey with you. Yeah. And don't forget, we turned a lot of these into customer stories. So when somebody replies to an email, because every single email that goes out from eWebinar replies to a human inbox. Like it doesn't go to no reply. So I get a lot of these responses. So when somebody replies with an objection, I can send them a customer story that was derived or a quote that was derived from specifically from this process. And the other thing I, I just remembered was another piece of content that we created from, from this process was actually quotes and testimonials. So we pulled out a whole bunch of quotes and testimonials and put them all over our site. And now we log them. Like previously, we logged them in Google Sheets, but now we log them in Senja, this new testimonial platform. And we get to use those snippets of testimonials on our customer story page that they can filter either by objection or by feature. And these are also quotes that we send out because we can say anything we want to a prospect or a customer, and it will not be worth as much as a customer saying that about us. And I think that social proof like that is just as powerful as you saying, we did all of this research and our data shows that attendance goes up three times instead of two customer quotes that said, we started using a webinar and our attendance went up three times. It's just as powerful. So if you don't have hard data yet, but your customers are saying these things, they will be enough to convince someone else. Absolutely. And actually a few days ago, somebody wrote a comment on someone else's LinkedIn post that was like, oh, I found you a webinar. This is amazing. Anyone wants to try this? I'm a webinar consultant. And somebody had commented, oh, this type of repetitive webinar doesn't work for bottom of the funnel. It might work. Like every time I come across it, I, I just shut the screen. You know, no one's going to buy if, if they see a webinar like this. And this is really specific for, for salespeople, right? Which is not exactly our target right now. Like our target is, is really onboarding and training. And I was able to respond by saying something along the lines of, oh, that's interesting. You know, respect that. I respect that you think that, but this is a customer story. And, you know, this is how we were able to help them convert three times by using this product. No response. <laughs> and it's hard when you're hearing the same thing over and over again from your customers in a positive way. You, you really start to realize that it's a not a universal experience, but pretty darn close. Okay, so I think that's probably up? a good place to wrap up, right? So just to summarize what we've talked about, we talked about why it's important to leverage your customers to sell your product and what our process was for extracting mm -hmm. that information for our customers, or rather Melissa specifically with Aaron, and then how you can do that for yourself with your own customers uh, and the list of questions that we'll make available to you in the show notes. So with all that in mind, what's your hot take for, the, for our listeners today? Yeah, my hot take is in the beginning, you're going to have a lot of different types of customers. And some are going to be better than others. And I don't mean the ones that pay you the most. Like some are going to be easier to work with, share more feedback, be more invested in your product. If you're going to do a process like this, if you're going to build relationship with your customers, start with those people. Like not all customers should be weighted equally. Some are actually pretty annoying and they pay you a lot. But working with them drains your energy. And they are most likely going to be ones that will leave for the smallest reasons. They're going to be the ones that are most sensitive to churn because they're so easily irritated. So in the beginning, if you're going to work with customers, find the people that are most patient, that are willing to give you their time, that want you to be a better product and company, that want to build a relationship with you because they see the value in what you're offering and spend the most time with those people. That, that is how you are can identify your best customers. And those are the ones that are going to refer you the best customers because those are going to become your best and loudest advocates. So that's who you're going to build, want to build relationships with. Todd, what's your hot take? I mean, mine is just don't underestimate the value of this. It is extremely powerful. It will fuel almost every decision you make, every piece of content you write for literally years. So don't gloss over it. I go back to those documents weekly. Like I'm referring to them. I, I want to grab one little snippet of something that I can't remember. So, you know, take the time. I can guarantee you, at least speaking from my own experience, that the barrier to start will seem insurmountable, but just don't let it stop you and, and take the time you need to do it because it's a gold mine. Perfect. I think that's a good place to wrap up. So if there are topics that you want us to get into this season, 
uh, let me know by connecting with me on LinkedIn. Or if you have any feedback about this podcast, I'd love to hear from you. My name is Melissa Kwan, last name spelled K-W-A-N. If you're enjoying this podcast, I've got a small favor to ask. The only way that Profit Light grows is by word of mouth. So if you do us a favor, hit the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching this podcast right now. That would be amazing and mean the world to us. To be notified of new episodes, join our mailing list by going to profitlet.fm. I promise to only share things you'll actually care about. Thanks for listening. Bye now. Thanks for listening to Profit Led. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you will subscribe to the Profit Led podcast and head over to our website, profitled.fm, to see the show notes of every episode. You can also join our mailing list to be notified of new episodes or when we have interesting products and resources to share. We promise to only share things you'll actually care about. Thanks again for listening. Bye now.